Our next speaker is Peter Bowler, an historian of biology at Queen's University in Belfast. He has written extensively on the history of evolutionary thought, uh, the history of en environmental sciences, and on the history of genetics. His book include Evolution, The History of an Idea, The Eclipse of Darwinism, and most recently, Science for All, The Popularization of Science in Early 20th Century Britain, um, which was published just uh, uh, about two weeks ago. So um, let's thank uh, Peter Bowler. Okay, thanks very much for that uh, introduction, and, and thanks to uh, Phil and the organizers of the conference for uh, bringing me here, because it gives me a chance to get back into Darwinism. As you just heard, my last book is on popular science, and I've not really been working in this field for a long time, but um, I'm thinking of coming back into it so I can fly ideas out to you, and you can shoot them down, uh, and that may help me if I come to write a, a, a book uh, in the future. And, and the project, it starts with a question that's been haunting me for some time, and I, I've joked about this for uh, some uh, at conferences with people uh, off and on. Um, and it relates to uh, trying to fix the position of Darwinism in the history of evolution of thought. And I'll pause for a moment while you get the uh, deliberate mistake uh, in that one. Because the reason for it is that the question has always haunted me is the top there. Um, what would have happened if Darwin fell overboard one night on the voyage of the Beagle, um, uh, or, or otherwise was incapacitated by his illness and so on, uh, and wasn't able to write The Origin of Species? Uh, what would the consequence of that be? Um, there are two answers to this question, the boring one, uh, which is the first one, uh, and the interesting one, which is the second one, which I want to explore myself. Um, a lot of people would say, well, without Darwin, uh, you would still have the theory of natural selection anyway because Wallace or someone else would have come along and published it, and things would have gone on just the same as in our world, but we wouldn't have the word Darwinism. Uh, I don't, it, does anyone believe in Wallaceism? And it, it, it gets tangled up in your tongue anyway. But that, that's, a, this, I call this the in the air thesis, the evolution by natural selection was in the air in the uh, mid 19th century. It was bound to come out anyway. If it didn't, wasn't Darwin, then someone else would do it. The more interesting answer, I think, is that without Darwin, um, things would be very different. That here we have a, a, one of those rare occasions when uh, someone does something quite unique, and if you take him out of the equation, then uh, things uh, don't develop in the same way, because I want to suggest that there are reasons for supposing there wasn't anyone else waiting in the wings who could have done exactly what uh, Darwin uh, did, not even Wallace, and hence that we would not have had the um, theory of natural selection being promoted aggressively in the uh, 1860s. I think we will, will have the theory of evolution, but it would be a theory of evolution without uh, natural selection. This is what we, we call counterfactual history. Imagine history going along a different branch. It's a very Darwinian way of looking at history, the, the, the branching tree. Are oh, there little really crucial uh, points where things uh, switch, switch over? Incidentally, with apologies for the primitive nature of a PowerPoint, I'm, I'm not a very um, a great fan of the new uh, technology. I've been dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century, and this is my primitive attempt uh, to do it. Now, the reason for doing this, for exploring this uh, question, uh, is, I think, to get at um, some uh, implications which are so routinely attached to Darwinism in the modern world, uh, and to persuade people to think about those implications rather differently uh, by saying that, 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 that we have tangled up our ideas with Darwinism that maybe don't necessarily have to be associated with it. Darwinism is widely perceived to be responsible for materialism, atheism, breakdown of the moral order. This is the, the standard argument of, of the uh, creationists who want to, uh, to eliminate the theory for, for that reason. It's also linked to ideologies of, of, of struggle and competition, so-called social Darwinism, uh, the, the implication being that without the theory, we would not have had, for instance, uh, and, and Bob Richards referred to this, Richard Weikart's uh, From Darwin to Hitler, the notion that Darwinism is somehow responsible for uh, Nazism uh, and the atrocities. Without Darwin, that, that, uh, the, the ideas of, of racial competition and so on wouldn't uh, be there. The question I want to use counterfactual history to answer is, well, could we not say uh, 
that those consequences might have emerged, uh, or some of them at least, in a world where there was no Darwin in, 18, in the 1860s. Because if you can do that, uh, if you can show the, the, a plausible alternative universe in which you get the consequences but without the theory being there, then that undermines the claim that the theory is responsible for those particular consequences. So I want to try three proposals on you. Uh, first of all, without Darwin, evolutionism, I think, would be accepted in the 1860s, a bit more slowly, but certainly much less traumatically than it was in, in our universe, uh, because there, there wouldn't be a theory of natural selection promoting it. It would come in through the non-Darwinian ideas of evolution that we know were very popular uh, at the time. So there would, it would possibly not be a revolution, at least it wouldn't be the, the, the sudden transformation that we, 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 we experienced. It would be a more gradual acceptance of evolutionism. Uh, and uh, it would be less traumatic because Darwinism uh, represented the most materialistic version of evolution theory. That's what got uh, the goat of, the, of the, the conservative religious thinkers and so on at the time, if that particular theory of evolution is not there, then the more general idea possibly could come in rather more, um, uh, w w w much, more much e easily. But I want to argue the third point, that uh, many of aspects of what we call social Darwinism would have emerged into the world uh, anyway in the late 19th and early 20th century, obviously not under that name, but they will be there because they don't depend on uh, a direct link to the theory of individualistic natural selection that, that, that was Darwin's key uh, insight. Now, what I'm going to have to do is bash very quickly through the first of these propositions, so to give room to time for me to deal with the, uh, the others. So what is counterfactual history? It's been widely dismissed by professional historians, but it is starting to gain something of a, uh, a following uh, now. It, it, it's popular with military historians, mainly because in many cases, in particular battles, you can see that the battle could have come out very differently with only a very slight change in the circumstances initially. The, the, the knock-on effects build up to, to give a different uh, consequence. Uh, I was turned on to this whole way of thinking by a, a book down there, Ward Moore's Bring the Jubilee. It's a sort of science fiction book set in a universe where the Confederacy won the Battle of Gettysburg and hence the Civil War. Um, uh, and uh, its thesis is that a very slight change in the disposition of the troops at the beginning of the battle altered the, the, the outcome. And so there, are, there could be these key uh, switching points in, in history. And another example there of, of what would happen if Hitler had won the Battle of Britain and, con uh, and conquered Britain in, in, in 1940. Uh, there are a number of examples here. Can there be a counterfactual history of science, though? And the charge that's raised on, on this, uh, Nicholas Rupka flew through this one at me at Göttingen only a week or so ago, is am I not undermining the objectivity of science by saying it could develop in a different way? Now, if there is a sort of inevitable logic to the sequence in which we have to discover things about nature, then obviously there cannot be a different history of science. But I want to suggest that the idea that there are at least occasionally branching points, such as the one I'm attributing to Darwin, doesn't undermine the objectivity of science because uh, our priorities in science, what we choose to investigate, or what we investigate first and what uh, uh, ideas and inspirations we get to first, can be shaped by uh, human uh, factors. So uh, the, 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 this, uh, this alters the order in which things are discovered, perhaps. It doesn't necessarily alter the actual total end, end uh, product. And as you'll see, uh, I, I argue that in my counterfactual universe, we do end up pretty much where we are today, but by a different order of discovery. And so counterfactual history may be able to help us to identify just where there might be key uh, switching points and what the important influences uh, were. So I think it does have a role to play in the history of science. And there was a little uh, section on uh, counterfactual history in, in the, the journal ISIS just a, a year or so, in which I contributed uh, to, to this. So let's um, start to very quickly th fly through what might have happened if there was no Darwin on, on the or to write the origin of species. Uh, I think there would have been a development of evolution theory. Look at uh, I'm giving here a few quick examples of things that historians have explored in the uh, 1840s and 50s, suggesting the general idea of evolution was becoming more and more uh, popular, so, so that uh, Darwin was... Um, Darwin, well, as we know, changed his own mind and, and, and 
decided to start writing his big book on evolution because he, he part, partly because he sensed that the a attitude towards the idea was changing. And I haven't got time to run through all of these uh, examples, uh, but uh, I think we can make the case that, that, that evolution was more thinkable in the late 1850s than it had been uh, a couple of uh, decades uh, earlier. Who else, though, would have promoted the theory of natural selection? And this is a crucial point, uh, point of my argument. Um, Patrick Matthew is one example who's quoted uh, who, uh, who, uh, as the, the real discoverer of natural selection. Uh, and there's a, a coterie of, of enthusiasts for Ma Matthew who claim that he should be regarded as the real discoverer of natural selection. And Darwin's just this Johnny come lately who, who, who shouldn't really get all the, all the credit. But Matthew, although he does state the basic idea of natural selection in 1831, buries it in the appendix to this book on uh, naval, naval timber. Uh, and never does anything with the idea. So I, I, I don't see him as uh, an example that, that, that helps the, the case there. Wallace is very different, because uh, we all know that Wallace pub, uh, wrote his famous paper in 1858 describing natural selection and sent it uh, to uh, Darwin. But I have problems with Wallace as an alternative to Darwin. If you take Darwin out of the equation, can, Darwin uh, can Wallace step in? My answer is, is no. His theory is very different uh, to Darwin's. Many historians, myself included, think that Wallace was really moving towards group selection rather than individual selection in 1858. Um, he certainly has no analogy with artificial selection. Wallace always rejected that, although it's a key part of Darwin's explanatory uh, program. So the major differences between Wallace's theory and, uh, and Darwin's. We know that when Wallace's paper was published along with Darwin's, it had no impact. No one paid any attention to the, those papers at the Linnaean Society. It was not until The Origin of Species came out that natural selection had uh, its impact. Now, could, when, when would Wallace have written a book equivalent to The Origin of Species? He was stuck out in the Far East till 1862. Couldn't have done much serious work there. I suggest it would be the late 1860s, uh, at least before Wallace could have produced anything like a substantial book on the topic. And by that time, things would have moved on, and Wallace would be uh, trying to fit into uh, a debate, an evolutionary debate already uh, underway. So without the origin of species and, and Wallace not as a plausible substitute, would there be an evolutionary movement? Uh, I'm going to say yes. If there was, uh, when would it have developed the theory of natural selection? If it's starting off with non-Darwinian theories, when does selection come in? And without selection, what would it have looked like in the meantime? Well, as I said earlier, probably a more gradual and less contentious transition to evolutionism. Spencer would have written his Principles of Biology in 1864, promoting the idea of evolution with a Lamarckian framework, but of course it wouldn't have the famous phrase, the survival of the fittest uh, in it. Uh, and I think Spencer could have been an important uh, philosophical uh, trigger to make people think more about evolution. In Germany, Ernst Haeckel uh, would be uh, m using the morphological evidence to move closer towards um, evolutionism, driven by his particular uh, ideological agenda, and I spoke to Bob Richards about this yesterday, and he agrees that, that, that without Darwin, Haeckel was going to become an evolutionist of some kind. Uh, anyway, both Spencer and uh, Haeckel favoring a more progressionist view of evolution, uh, a rather more purposeful view of evolution, uh, with a lot more Lamarckism in it. So what I'm suggesting very quickly is that what we would have had in the late 19th century is a kind of Evo Devo uh, ahead of its time. Uh, a lot of the uh, ideas that, that, uh, 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 of the non-Darwinian movements uh, that we know in our universe, which I think would have been more important at the time, are uh, reminiscent of issues that have re-emerged with Evo, Evo Devo. Um, uh, and I mentioned there on Amundsen's book of 2005, which is a book I intensely dislike because uh, its history is very simplistic, but it makes the important point that uh, if you think that Evo Devo is having an, Im an important effect uh, on, on, on modern evolutionary thinking, many of the issues it raises are those that were active during the non-Darwinian uh, debates uh, uh, of the late 19th and very early 20th century, which were submerged with the rise of, of modern 
modern uh, ge genetics. So you'd have an Evo Devo based uh, uh, on Lamarckism and on developmental trends, and I haven't got any time to deal with these I in detail. There probably would have been less debate, at least in the 1860s, 70s, over the nature of variation and heredity, because a lot of those debates were triggered by people who didn't like natural selection and were looking for ways and shooting it down. So Fleming Jenkin wouldn't have, uh, uh, have uh, written uh, anything on the topic. Uh, I suspect that August Weissman probably would not have got into a, a kind of selectionism on his own. And Francis Galton wouldn't have got into anything along these lines, because uh, one of his main reasons for, for jumping into that area of science was that he was Darwin's cousin, uh, and so he had an obvious uh, link in. So I think that, that uh, some of the uh, debates that, that Jean has written uh, about so, uh, so well uh, probably would not uh, uh, have occurred at all without Darwin. So when do you get genetics and the selection theory? Um, I would suggest in the very, very end of the 19th century or the early 20th century, I remind you that most of the founders of modern genetics were originally saltationists, and saltationism, evolution by jumps, sudden jumps, uh, macromutations, is an important part of the non-Darwinian uh, movement. And uh, selection, the idea of natural selection might have come in uh, from a belated recognition that uh, given the strength of the eugenics movement, which I'll return to in a moment, uh, the model of artificial selection, so crucial for Darwin, but not for Wallace, and I don't think for anyone else at the time, that's when people are suddenly wake up, hang on, if we're going to apply artificial selection to uh, human beings, could there be a, a natural equivalent? And, and maybe that's when uh, natural selection would come in. So what we get to is the, uh, the end product where um, Evo Devo comes first and natural selection is added on to it. So it's the opposite way round to what we have. But you end up in roughly the same uh, place, the same com combination of, of, of sciences that I think are beginning to circulate and integrate uh, today. So that's why I'm saying I don't think this undermines the objectivity of science. The, 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 we, the same ideas, the same theories come out, but in a different sequence. And the question is, does it make any difference to how we think about the theories, the fact that they've uh, appeared in a different sequence to the one we are uh, familiar with? Well, religion. I want to argue that without the, what I call the bogeyman of uh, Darwinian natural selection, evolution in its most materialistic form, it would have been e easier for many religious thinkers to accept the uh, general idea of evolution. There wouldn't be the classic debate between Huxley and Wilberforce, because Huxley wouldn't have wanted to take up uh, would, uh, was uh, only keen on natural selection as an arguing point against uh, religion. He wasn't actually very keen on it in his science. And of course, Wilberforce is only antagonistic to the e evolution, or at least one of the main reasons was because of the extreme materialism of natural selection. Now, I'm leaving aside there the important issue of the origin of humans and the origin of the human soul, which would have been an issue anyway, but I haven't got time to go I into that particular uh, one. So we, we go going back there, there will be no uh, Huxley uh, Wilberforce uh, debate, uh, and nothing equivalent to that. Uh, evolutionism, I think, would have been accepted more uh, with uh, by liberal thinkers, and um, that's because the Lamarckian theory was always uh, seen as much more amenable to uh, to a, uh, to a, 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 the, the the idea of a designed uh, world. Charles Kingsley, I mentioned there is an example. The Water Babies, often seen as a Darwinian uh, uh, moral tale. In fact, it's pure Lamarckism. It, it, it's struggle and effort is what gets progress, uh, and idleness and sloth is what makes you de degenerate, and that's pure Lamarckism. It's, it, it's not uh, natural uh, selection. Um, and I I in, um, in America, uh, uh, religious thinkers like uh, uh, Beecher, who was very much a, a, a product of Herbert Spencer's school, and, uh, and I mentioned there Jim Moore's book uh, on the, uh, evolution and religion, which very much promotes the, Spencer, the role of Spencerianism in, in, in helping religious thinkers to uh, accommodate themselves to the idea. So if evolutionism was accepted without raising quite so many hackles in the religious community uh, as it did in our world, could we even imagine a situation where in the early 20th century, the fundamentalist movement in America, and I realize I'm talking to the wrong audience here, <laughs> but um, would not have identified Darwinism as that um, 
focus uh, of uh, that symbol of the modernization uh, the, uh, that it so distrusted as undermining uh, American uh, moral values. So it may have picked on something else, and I'm not going to predict what, but, but had evolutionism not got this image of the bogeyman of Darwinism, is it conceivable that, 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 that the, uh, the cre what we call creationism wouldn't have been quite so um, central to the, uh, the fundamentalist uh, position. They might look for other scapegoats. So there'd be no uh, Scopes trial and possibly um, no modern creationism. Um, I'm obviously I'm speculating wildly here, but it seems to me that we could imagine a situation where Darwinism didn't have that, uh, evolutionism didn't have that uh, image that is promoted in the Creation Museum we just heard about uh, that is used to, to, to undermine it to, to today. So social Darwinism, uh, I would like to argue that most of the ideologies that we call social Darwinism or that people like Weikart uh, focus on to discredit the selection theory would have appeared anyway. Herbert Spencer's ideology focuses on individual competition. That's the classic analogy of between Darwinism and free enterprise capitalism. But uh, Spencer's argument for uh, progress through struggle was based on the, the idea that struggle stimulates uh, individual self-improvement. People uh, are, are, are improve themselves uh, through effort and initiative when challenged, and those improvements are transmitted to their descendants through the Lamarckian uh, process. So there would have been a Spencerian form of social Darwinism uh, with, without the theory of, of natural uh, selection. And social evolutionism uh, would have been, as I say, there possibly a less obvious target for left-wing cricket critics in the, uh, in, in the early 20th century. The model of less fit races being eliminated uh, by struggle, I think, would exist without Darwinism. Because uh, I I even in our universe, uh, a lot of the people who uh, appealed to the elimination of unfit races from Heckel through, through to various paleoanthropologists talking about the extinction of the Neanderthals were not Darwinians. Uh, explicitly did not believe in individual natural selection. So the notion of competition at the tribal or, or, or racial or species level, I think, would have emerged without the Darwinian theory of individual natural selection. And so uh, I would argue that all of those uh, um, ideologies that Weikart identifies as, uh, as being the evil consequences of Darwinism would be there. Nationalism, militarism, imperialism, and ultimately Nazism would uh, have emerged even without uh, the circulation of the individualistic theory of natural selection. What about race theory? Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the central features of Weikart's thesis. Well, uh, Darwin and Wallace both opposed the most extreme forms of, of um, 19th century uh, racism, which were being promoted, uh, as Jim Moore and Adrian Desmond have shown uh, in their latest book, most actively by creationists, such as Agassiz, and by the non-Darwinian uh, evolutionists, such as the American neo-Lamarckians, Cope, uh, and Hyatt. So biological race theory would be there without the Darwinian theory of natural selection. Physical anthropologists would have been identifying the, um, the uh, racial hierarchy, uh, arguing that some races are closer to the apes than others without uh, Darwinism. Uh, Darwin, here's Darwin, uh, the, a picture of the Fuegians that Darwin knew about, the sort of su uh, 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 situation of taking a naked savage and converting him into an English gentleman that convinced Darwin uh, that, 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 that the human races were part of a common family, uh, not separately uh, formed uh, species. And this is a classic image of, of 19th century uh, racist uh, anthropology. This is from Robert Knox, the uh, image of the, the, the black face uh, projecting out beyond the, the, the Grecian figure on the left there, uh, obviously being meant to indicate that the, that the black uh, features are, are more allied to the, the, the ape. But this is from the 1850s, before Darwinism came out, and Knox was not an evolutionist. So uh, that sort of thinking c comes out without uh, any need for, uh, for uh, Darwinism. And eugenics. 
my final point. Um, I think that the emergence of a eugenics movement at the very end of the 19th century is part of a wide social trend which is not going to be affected by the science. In fact, the eugenics would focus people's attention on heredity. The more people were concerned about eliminating unfit individuals from society, the more they would focus uh, on, uh, on heredity. That would help to promote the uh, discoveries like uh, it would lead to genetics. Um, most geneticists in our universe were not Darwinians uh, to begin with, uh, and you can justify eugenics by appealing to artificial selection with animals uh, without any need to, uh, to, to, to pick up on, on uh, natural uh, selection. And bear in mind, as I pointed out there, that animal breeders can be pretty ruthless. How do you breed a good new breed of pigeons? You kill a lot of pigeons. You wring the necks. Uh, so animal breeders were notoriously ruthless in the way in which they, they applied selection. They killed animals so that you would have a ruthlessness there without the appeal to natural selection. And there's also, I mentioned, and I haven't got time to go into it, that uh, medical analogies were used. Uh, how do you get rid of a diseased part of the body? You cut it out. So eugenics could appeal to medical analogies too. There's lots of ways in which eugenics could have been justified, even if the idea of natural selection was not, uh, not circulating. And one component that I think Darwinism did supply was, well, I think it was David Cohn, was it, Phil, who called it the creative power of death? Uh, something like that. The, 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 the focus on nature having to kill lots of organisms in order to, for, for evolution to occur. That is one uh, factor which I think uh, natural selection did provide in our universe that made eugenics a much harsher factor. So here I suggest is if, if people like Weichart want to make out a case for Darwinism being, in quotes, responsible for the nastiness, this is probably their best shot. Uh, and I would invite comments uh, uh, as to uh, how people respond to uh, that suggestion. So my conclusions are that our perceptions of Darwinism's implications are shaped by its particular history, not by the essence of the theory and what people necessarily connect uh, to the, those uh, essential points. Um, because of the particular sequence in which events occurred in our universe, Darwinism acquired a set of alleged implications for religion, uh, and more importantly, and for what I've been saying, in, in, in the, it's the social consequent, uh, consequences, which are, are, are contingent on the particular way in which things worked out and allowed Darwinism to be associated with those uh, implications. But that's a product not of a necessary relationship between the science and the theory, uh, but uh, of the particular sequence of events uh, which uh, were... Uh, which occurred in our universe, and if we can develop the plausible counterfactual world where those consequences follow without the theory, then I think we have the best way of um, undermining the credibility of Weichart's thesis. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I think your uh, scenario is very attractive. I would add one more dimension to the, that. This is the geographical context. Maybe in a, a world without uh, Darwin, perhaps uh, the idea of evolution and eventually natural selection could have evolved, for example, in Germany. Not simply because of the Heckelian tradition in comparative morphology, uh, phylogenetics, uh, what eventually became phylogenetics, but also tradition in uh, development of biology and ecology. From ecology, we know uh, the concept of biosynosis is a German product in a sense, at least conventionally. Uh, in uh, developmental biology, people like Ru, the founder of uh, developmental mechanics, imported the idea of selection, apply it to the parts within the organism. This struggle of parts within the organism. This is a very beautiful text of uh, 1880 something. So maybe, uh, your scenario of a possible um, anticipated evolution of evil evil could have worked in the reverse. Ideas of competition eventually coming from development and being subsequently applied to organisms. Just that. 
uh, and if so, uh, a revolution burgeoning in Germany rather than in Britain could have found a different uh, context also in terms of religion and so on. Yes, that's a very interesting uh, suggestion that, that um, there are other uh, uh, possible sources of the idea of, of, of struggle there. And I think the, the earlier suggestion about the, the role of, of, of biogeography is, is crucial because uh, Wallace uh, shared Darwin's interest in biogeography and, of course, wrote extensively on it uh, in his later career uh, and presumably would have done that anyway. Uh, and would have promoted certainly his own version of natural selection, which might have been rather more, as I said, of a, a group selection model. Uh, so I think that the biogeography would be pushing things in an interesting direction, certainly adding a dimension that isn't there in the morphological uh, debates. I mean, uh, Heckel talks a bit about biogeography, but it's a very small amount. So I think that the, the, the biogeographers, yes, would have been adding that dimension there, and, and I, I have to think more about uh, just when, whether that might have triggered a natural selection event uh, discovery sort of in the eight, late 1870s or 80s or something like that. It, it's a possibility. The trouble with counterfactual history, of course, is that you can devise any number of alternative, uh, I mean, you could actually devise an alternative universe where the absence of Darwin uh, leaves people saying, well, evolution's just, um, as, as Huxley was saying immediately before Darwin, it's just speculative nonsense, it's no business of, of, of the scientists. Uh, and they all go off into the biomedical sciences and, and we never get an evolutionism anyway at all. It's a, it's a, it's a conceivable uh, way of doing it. So that's the problem, there are so many counterfactual universes. Mine is only one amongst many. Uh, yes, go ahead. I was wondering, since we're in the domain of science fiction anyway, uh, I remember a remark by Dawkins where he says uh, that if you want to measure intelligence on other planets or something, then you have to wonder, did they discover evolution yet? And he thought that the idea uh, that the discovery of natural selection would be inevitable in, yeah, on other planets if there is life there, since it would have emerged through Darwinian principles. And this seems to be the case even in your world where there's no Darwin, I mean, eventually it, uh, the order is different, but you are first evil evil, but you end up with uh, Darwinian theory anyway, so can you speculate on, on this? Um, well, I, yes, I mean, I, I, I'm not too keen on Dawkins' uh, idea that, uh, uh, that it has to be by natural selection everywhere in the universe. Uh, I think we'd be a little bit arrogant to suggest that, 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 that there aren't possibly other forms of life, but I'm not an expert on that area. Um, the, 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 the question you're asking really do, depend, relates to that point I made at the very beginning. Does counterfactual history undermine the objectivity of, uh, of science? And it, so the, and the argument would be that if um, you know, natural selection is a reality, that's how it really, 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 really works, then we have to discover it uh, sooner or, 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 or later. Um, the, 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 the question seems to be, though, that an awful lot of people in the late 19th century didn't want to believe it was natural selection, even when Darwin had pointed it out to them. Uh, and so explore, were quite happy to explore the idea of evolution without natural selection. Uh, and so uh, I think we need to uncouple the, the, the two. You, you, can, you can be an evolutionist, and, and lots of people were in the late 19th century without believing in natural selection. Uh, where the, how long that could be sustained is the sort of question we've just been talking about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. This is really a question about how historians of science work. It's very easy with a sort of a retrospectoscope, with a retrospectoscope to go back to Darwin and to see the beginnings of things like morphological integration and, and half a dozen other things. How do you, how do you protect against seeing those things that actually are not there yet, yet from where you, we are now, we recognize them. Yeah. Um, and the history of science always has the problem of, of, of reading modern uh, ideas back into the past. I mean, the, you know, what, what we have to train our students to do is, is to stop thinking like a modern scientist. And I have the advantage that I have no training whatsoever in biology, so that I, I can't unlearn uh, any, bio, uh, any modern uh, biology. Uh, and it is very crucial when we go back into the past to, 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 to read uh, things uh, to, to reconstruct the context of, of their time. And a good example is Wallace here, where we, you know, people have always read 
his papers about the, the, the survival of varieties, and people always read varieties meaning individual variations. But if you actually go and read the thing, uh, a lot of us feel it doesn't sound like that. So um, that, that's an example, I suppose, of, of the, 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 the care you have to take to try and uh, to, uh, assess what's going on. And it's a very interesting case of it. You know, if Wallace didn't then encounter Darwin, would he have just carried on doing a different form of, of natural selection? So I, I'm not sure that's a proper answer to your question, but we, 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 no, we, very good we have to um, guard against that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and even more so, I think, for counterfactuals. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I, actually, my question is also on, I guess, the logic of counterfactuals, although I'm interested in particular about how you've been applying it to, let's say, ideological history. And I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm really, I think I'm sympathetic to what seems to be an assumption on your part of, of sort of a, a movement away from, let's say, an orthodox Marxist reading of, of ideology where the, the, the concept was originally developed. Um, and, and towards an idea that, in fact, ideologies can be productive of, of things that happen on other historical levels. However, um, it, it, certainly there are some, certainly Marx is, is right when he says that, or when he suggests that uh, one thing about ideologies is, and, and you've pointed this out at a few points, is that they uh, use the beliefs that are available to justify things that are probably going on anyway. So I'm wondering, um, and, and I, I'm interested in this particularly when you're talking about here the debates between evolution and religion. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you see that playing out here in America. Uh, specifically, you, you mentioned um, the, the fact that uh, Darwin has become a, a bogeyman at least twice in the history of American fundamentalism, right? And with different effects in both cases. Um, so I'm wondering what specifically does the idea of natural selection give, let's say, uh, fundamentalists in the 20s who were um, carrying on a project, uh, a sort of resentment of, of an enlightenment uh, elite in America that was that uh, predated Darwinism, or now uh, where we see it being used to an ideology that's you know promoting or attacking uh, reproductive rights, uh, you know it's, it's highly homophobic, and that these are the you know these are the productive effects of this movement, right? So I'm wondering if we say okay, so they would have had a different bogeyman. Would that have changed the way in which the beliefs of uh, American fundamentalists would have been expressed, you think? Yeah, almost certainly. But the question is how much. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm not sufficient of an expert on American cultural history but to really to uh, address that. Um, I mean, the, the, the suggestion I, I'm making is that the, the, the in a sense, we, we come back to this question of what, how much of history is broad trends and how many of these branching points are there? And I suspect there aren't a lot of branching points. Uh, and that's why, to me, it seems obvious that, that um, you know, fundamentalism would have reared its head in, in early 20th century. And eugenics would have reared its head in, in, in around the turn of the century because they, 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 there seem to be so many social pressures pushing uh, uh, people's thinking in, in that direction. The question, as you, as you rightly say, is ideologies pick up whatever ammunition they can find to, to fight their battles with. Uh, and so if they can pick up you know, Darwinism, they'll pick that up. But if that wasn't there, they'd pick up something, something else, which, which might in some cases look a bit like Darwinism. As I say, the idea of, of, of racial competition could be there without the notion of individual competition. Um, the question of how much that would then play out into modifying it would modify the rhetoric of the, of the debate. Would it modify the substance of it? And um, I have to say, I, I don't know in that kind of, and I, and I prefer not to sort of second guess it off the top of my head, particularly in front of an American audience. <laughs> Fair enough, thanks. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, so if you're interested in the, uh, the implications of Darwinism and the implications of its, or sorry, the implications of natural selection and its absence, why not just start with that rather than um, starting with Darwin? I mean, it seems to me you get a much cleaner presentation if you just assume, you know, as your counterfactual antecedent, suppose nat natural selection had never been discovered rather than suppose Darwin had never discovered natural selection. Um, 
I suppose I want to focus on Darwin partly because uh, uh, of the shenanigans going on in this bicentenary year that it's, it's, it'll be a good selling point if I can get the book out uh, while it's still in people's uh, memories. Uh, um, but uh, I, I think I, I am concerned uh, to defend Darwin's originality. And I wrote a little piece in Science about this a, a year or so ago. It, it seems to me that, um, uh, you know, honestly, I, I don't see anyone else thinking along those lines. Uh, and I think if we want to give uh, credit to Darwin, and presumably we do, considering the huge amount of, uh, of um, celebrations we've had this year, then it's uh, important to... Um, to identify him very clearly and specifically as the originator of this theory in a way that Wallace wasn't and, and that Matthew was in a sense but couldn't make anything of it. Uh, so uh, I suppose um, I, I, I want to personalize it for those reasons. Um, and uh, uh, because I, I, to me, uh, it seems that Darwin is unique in as being the one person who, who, who was thinking along those lines. Uh, that that uh, it, 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 it seems better to, to, to use him as the focus. But I, I see your point that you might sort of take the theory out altogether. But I, to me, because I identify the theory with him so much more closely, uh, that, that, that I want to go along those lines. Thanks. All right, let's take one more question. Uh, Eric Peterson, I'm from here at Notre Dame. Um, <clears throat> I think it's sometimes silly to uh, quibble over counterfactual history, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, uh, George Eliot sort of maybe famously wrote a letter saying in uh, early 1860, hey, you know, we finally have a scientist who agrees with our position that we already hold. So I wonder if we looked a little bit closely, a little bit more closely at the literary community, we might actually see some of these ideas appearing, uh, perhaps not in their robust form, but uh, in a way that's much more, um, a lot closer to what Darwin actually said. I'm thinking specifically of Sam Butler, uh, who, if we, if we read Erewhon, and usually he's portrayed as a, a Lamarckian, but if we read Erewhon closely, he comes up with a theory of natural selection sort of on his own that's um, much more robust than um, some of his compatriots at the time. I'm wondering why his name didn't come up in this particular um, context. I'm also wondering if you might have a stronger argument um, saying why Darwin uh, didn't contribute to the evolutionary movement if, or wouldn't have uh, contributed to the eugenics movement if you just um, show how some of his progeny were involved in eugenics in the early part, late 19th and early part of the 20th century. If Darwin hadn't lived, you know, obviously they wouldn't have contributed to it. So. That's obvious. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the literary point I is an important one, uh, and, and, and I have to do a lot more work on, on uh, exploring the literary and cultural aspects of this. I think that the, the the literary community was certainly talking about evolution theory. Um, uh, I, I will reread Butler to see how close I think he's coming to Darwinism. And they, they, they would, they, he's still writing after Darwin, so there's a question of whether he would have got it independently. Um, certainly, my preliminary reading in this area suggests to me that, again, there's an awful lot of a tendency to assume that uh, you see Darwin everywhere. You know, any mention of struggle, well, it must be Darwin. Well, no, it mustn't, because the idea of struggle was circulating pretty generally anyway. Um, you know, everyone knew about Malthus and, uh, and so on. So there is a tendency for people to read Darwin into a, a everything that we've got to be very, very careful uh, to av avoid. Um, um, my, obviously, m an important part of my job is to go through all that stuff and, and carefully rule out every hint of Darwinism unless it's absolutely clear that they mean natural selection. And so th there's a lot of work to do there. Yeah, so thanks for that example. Yeah. Thank you. Let's again thank our speaker.